Well, we are grateful to live in the nation that we do, the, the bounty that we have, and we get to celebrate that on Thursday. And I hope uh, you have time set aside on that day for thanking God for his many blessings uh, that he has bestowed on us. Uh, he is a good God, and He gives good and perfect things to us. And um, just spend some time, spend a, spend some time with family, but spend some time praising Him for who He is and what He has done for us. Well, this morning we're going to continue in our sermon series through Ephesians. Uh, today we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter four, starting at verse seventeen. Um, I wanted to first give you a, uh, actually I wanted to first give you a few announcements about the upcoming uh, Christmas season. Um, we will be having, some dates that I want you to keep in mind, December 2nd, Pastor Tom will, beginning, uh, will begin a series on the Advent, uh, so that'll be December 2nd. December 9th will be our children's choir musical, December 16th will be our adult choir musical. And then on December 24th, Christmas Eve, we will have uh, two Christmas Eve services, 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Uh, we invite you all to come to that. And please invite as many uh, co-workers, friends, family members. Uh, we would love to have two jam-packed services. We are actually going to have some flyers and door hangers made up. We're hoping to have those available for next Sunday. Uh, so you can pick those up then. I also wanted to mention uh, my, my son Levi. Many of you know that he had uh, his MRI on Friday as uh, just kind of his, his follow-up. Um, he, he did not respond as well as, as he has previously. Uh, so Friday night we were up all night. He was uh, sick to his stomach all night and uh, had a temperature of 103. That seems to be getting better. Uh, but that's where, that's where Katie is this morning. She's staying at home. So hi, Levi. Hi, bud. Um, we uh, will hopefully get the results of that MRI uh, this upcoming week, but just be praying for us. We'd, we'd really, really, really uh, appreciate that. Um, so we are, are diving into Ephesians today, uh, Ephesians 4.17, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. Uh, also, if you have the Uversion app, you can uh, click there. Under the events page, you should see our service, and it should have uh, the text that we're going to be using today. However, I'm going to start us off this morning with two verses from Isaiah. Isaiah 64, verse 6, and it says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And then skipping back a couple of chapters, uh, chapter 61, verse 10, He has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. So what are we going to talk about today? Clothes, right? Clothes. We're going to talk about clothes. So uh, since we're going to be talking about this all morning, I know that some of you might get uh, the itch to go to the mall uh, later on this afternoon. I, I like Old Navy, and uh, they have a rewards program. So if you want to, you know, give me uh, just, I'm, they'll, they'll know. Just mention my name. It's fine. Uh, so we're going to talk about clothes today. Now, obviously, we're not talking about physical clothes. We're talking about uh, our, our, uh, our actions, uh, righteousness being visible to others. But people make a snap decision based on clothes, right? And, and now I am talking about physical clothes. When they see the clothes that you're wearing, there is a snap decision made about who you are, about the kind of person that you are, about what you do even. Uh, as we teach our children, one of the things that we'll teach them when they're very young is what a policeman wears, right? And so it's a, it's a uniform and, and it's a badge. Uh, here's what a doctor wears, right? And you show them a picture of, of a doctor and, and they have their scrubs on and the, the surgical mask. They, we identify a person by what they wear. Uh, right or wrong, our clothes, what we wear, tell us a lot about ourselves, tell us a lot about other people, tell the world who we are. So now as we move into Ephesians, I want you to take 
those concepts, and we're going to be talking about those this morning. First, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for our time together. We thank you for who you are. There is so much in our lives that we have to be thankful for. We do thank you even for, for the clothes on our back. There's people around this world that do not have just that, these, these things that we take for granted. Last week, we, we were able to say thank you to our servicemen and women. Lord, we thank you, recognizing that anything and everything that we have, it comes from you. And we, you, you have our gratitude, you have our praise, you have our love. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our time to be in it this morning. Guide us and direct us, we pray in your name. Amen. So last week, Pastor Tom spoke on uh, gifts and talents and, and, and the giftedness and talents that we find in Christ and then how we find unity together as a body using those gifts and talents. And we're going to proceed now into, uh, again, chapter 4, verse 17. We're going to start. Uh, and Paul's, Paul writes this. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the, fu in the futility of their mind. Now last month when I was up here, we talked about the the many differences between Jew and Gentile, right? There's political differences, there's cultural differences, there's religious differences. And so when Paul is talking about the Gentiles here, I, I think he's talking mainly about the religious differences. So as he's, as he's speaking with, uh, with these, both the Jewish people and the Gentile people of, of the uh, burgeoning church at Ephesus, He's, he's uh, mentioning the Gentiles who have no knowledge, who have no knowledge of God, who have no understanding, who have no experience uh, of God. The, the, uh, the last phrase, and actually if we could go back one slide, uh, Linda, the last phrase there in the futility of their mind. Sin e exhibits itself many times in action, right? Uh, I would say the majority of sin tends to be a, a physical a physical uh, action. And yet that's not where sin sin begins in the heart and the mind. And I want to, I want to read you uh, this statement. And if you have a pen, I want you to write this statement down. Uh, this statement is, the wickedness of the heart convinces the weakness of the mind to give in to the wanting of the body. That kind of describes a lot of sin, right? The wickedness of the heart convic convinces the weakness of the mind to give in to the wanting of the body. We have futile minds. We have weak minds. And when that wickedness in our heart, that nature that we have because of original sin, when that wickedness in our heart convinces our mind, no, doing this thing is actually a good thing despite the fact that God says it isn't, we give in to that wanting of the body and we do it. Um, I saw this uh, take place in, uh, in, in my son. Uh, if you have children, uh, maybe, you've, maybe you have a story that's very similar, but uh, when Levi was, I, I don't even think he was uh, one year old, uh, we were sitting in our living room and we were watching some TV or something and, and he wasn't walking yet. He crawls over to the stereo system there and, uh, and he starts playing with the, the buttons. I said, Levi, no, no, don't, don't do that. It, it wasn't the first time I told him no. He, he understood no. He understood uh, uh, that, that he was doing something wrong. Uh, and, and every time before, when I would say no, he's, okay, he's going to move on to something else. But I watched him. And when I said, no, stop, don't do that, he had this moment. 
and you could see the wheels turning. And you could see him, even, again, he's, he's not even one year old, but you could see him think, hmm, Dad said no, but I want to do it. I don't know what will happen if I, if I continue doing it, but boy, I want to do it. And of course, he did it. And I watched this moment unfold, and it, and it was like time was standing still. And, and, and watching him go through this thought process was really interesting. I, I was not happy, I'll, I'll admit. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but watching him actually think about right and wrong and choosing wrong. If you're a parent, I'm, I'm guessing you probably have a, a similar story. Uh, but we, this is, is, is clear evidence of the wickedness of the human heart. It's, it's, it sounds terrible to say that my one-year-old son was wicked. But that's, that's where all of our hearts are. We have this sin nature in us. All have sinned. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and, come sh and fallen short of the glory of God. This includes one-year-old sons, right? So we have a futile mind, a weak mind that is convinced by the wickedness of our heart to give in to the wanting of our flesh. Verse 18, and being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Now, a lot of times when we speak about the world, uh, many times we talk about them not knowing. Is that true? No, the world, the world actually does know right from wrong. The reason being, we were created in God's image. Every single person in this world was created in God's image. And one of the things that we receive in being created in God's image is an understanding of right and wrong. Some, some people might call that morality. We call that holiness and sin. But the world does know what sin is. Uh, for, for example, the vast majority of crimes that we have in this country, uh, murder and theft and, and, and uh, uh, financial indiscretion, embezzlement, those types of things, those are laws not just in our country, those are laws in every country. Why would laws in this country be the same as laws in every other culture? Because we have this objective standard of right and wrong that comes from God. But we have become callous. The world has become calloused to right and wrong. Now, I am a guitar player. And guitar players, that, well, really any stringed instrument players, have calluses on their fingers. This is very important. We are actually grateful for calluses. Uh, when, when you play a guitar, especially a guitar, other stringed instruments, yes, but especially a guitar because of the, the material that the guitar strings is made of, because of the pressure that you have to press down to create the proper sound, you're grateful when you build calluses on your fingertips. It hurts a lot less. When you begin to play guitar, it's kind of painful. Your kind of uh, guitar players, when they begin, are, are kind of masochists. They, they, they have to go through a lot of pain to get where they want to go. But fortunately, we gain calluses, that pain goes away. People that work with their hands, carpenters or anybody else that works with their hands, they are grateful for the calluses that they have. It's that buildup that decreases the pain that, they, that their hands will go through and, and, uh, and, and that pain uh, gradually subsides until 
it, it's probably not there anymore because of the calluses. Unfortunately, the calluses that Paul is writing about are not good calluses. You see, when anyone, when, when, when we, when the world um, gives in to that, that fleshly desire, there is pain. There's this pang of guilt. There's this pang of remorse, of seeing what that sin does to themselves and seeing what it does to other people. There's a pain. But sometimes that wanting of the, of the flesh, wanting of the body is so strong that that sin continues. And that pain subsides. It lessens. There is a callus that has grown to that sin so that it doesn't hurt as bad. Um, this week, one of our staff members shared a video that they, uh, they were introduced to. And I want to show you this video and show you exactly uh, one area where we see calluses built up in our society. Now, <clears throat> this video uh, has made the rounds this week. I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure why it was actually uploaded to YouTube three years ago. Uh, but some, I guess someone must have found it, and uh, it's, it's made the circles this week. <sighs> it shows where our society has given themselves calluses. That human life is not to be regarded highly. I, I want to give you some statistics on abortion. These statistics come from the CDC. In 1970, uh, this is three years before Roe v. Wade, 1970, there were 193,491 abortions. Uh, that number, and, and by the way, this is, I, I'm speaking just of abortions in the U.S. Uh, it peaked in 1990 with more than 1.4 million abortions. Uh, in the U.S. alone, again, just in the U.S., uh, we're not really sure uh, of how many abortions have, have taken place, but it's definitely somewhere in the range of, of 60 million. Uh, to put that into perspective, the population of, of Canada right now is less than 37 million. We, we have killed in this country over the past 50 years the population of a large country. Now, this has been done uh, under the guise of legislation and the idea that uh, it's a woman's body and therefore a woman's choice. But we as a country have become callous to this notion. Uh, one other stat I read said that in, in 2014 when they did a, a survey, 37% of, of pregnancies in New York City ended in abortion. 37%. This is something we're callous to. I'm sure, I, I, I don't know, I, I was not alive at the time of, of Roe v. Wade. But I'm sure that the percentage of people that fought against it 
that, um, that, that, that struggled with that, that, uh, that decision was far greater than the percentage of people that struggle with it today. That pain has decreased over time because our country has built up the calluses. Now, we would love to say that that's the world, that it's the world that's become calloused. Uh, it's their fault. But in uh, 2015, a group called CareNet did a survey, and it found out that more than 40% of women who had an abortion were active churchgoers. This is not just a problem where the world has built up calluses. This, this problem extends to the church. And these facts that, I, that I've thrown out at you, they are not nice to hear. And if it hurts your heart to hear these things and to watch that video, I'm glad. These types of things should hurt. They should make us raw. They should make us feel vulnerable. They should wound us. And if they do, that's good. It means we haven't built up those calluses. And yet, this is, this is just one sin we're talking about. Right? How many other sins have we become callous to? There remains one person who is never callous to sin. God. Every sin, each and every sin, despite what our thoughts are on the matter, each and every sin, it grieves him. We're going to be talking about grieve, uh, grieving God um, in a little while. So let's continue. That is... Uh, Paul says that's the way the Gentiles think. That's the way the world thinks. That's the way that people who have no knowledge of God think. That's not the way that we should think. Verse 20, you did not learn Christ in this way. You should know better. We should all know better because we understand who God is. That was verse 20. Verse 21, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. This is Paul's use of, of uh, rhetoric. Of course, of course you've heard him. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. This laying aside, this is the very first step in changing our clothes. Laying aside of the old self. That's the very first step. Remember that one. Verse 23. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is the second step. Renewing of the spirit. Uh, re being renewed in the spirit of your mind. If sin begins in the heart and convinces the mind, then we must strengthen the mind. We must renew the mind. Well, where does that renewal process begin? It begins with God does not begin with us. It begins with God. Now this, this phrase about the renewing the spirit of the mind, as I was reading this and, and preparing, uh, it brought to mind another verse, that, that a very uh, famous verse, uh, Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In, in Paul's, Paul's letter to Ephesians, he talks about the renewing of the mind. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he talks about the renewing of the mind. Well, what is this purpose of renewing your mind? That purpose is defined in Romans 12, 1, which says this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, I think it was 
either two weeks ago or three weeks ago, Pastor Tom painted us a little picture that you might remember. He talked about in the life hereafter, being in heaven, being with God, uh, singing his praise, praising him constantly, worshiping him constantly, uh, and receiving the crowns that, that we have been promised in Scripture. And what will we do with those crowns? God will give us those crowns, and we will lay them at his feet in our worship of him, in our, our gratitude of him, in recognizing that he is Lord of all. We, take, we will take those crowns we are, give them, we, are, we are given and give them back to him. Now, taking this idea into what we're talking about in, in Romans, or, or excuse me, in Ephesians. In, in Romans, Paul is talking about uh, 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 or, or uh, uh, what Tom was talking about is the life hereafter in heaven. But we can do that same exact thing here on earth. God is going to be renewing our mind for the purpose of transforming our bodies, transforming our lives into a holy, living, acceptable offering to him. God begins that renewal. God gives us that renewal. He gives us uh, lives that are worthy of him, and we in turn give that back to him as a spiritual service of worship. So let's go back to Ephesians uh, verse 24. And here's our third step. And put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Putting on the new is the third step. Now, when you are, maybe you'll go home today and, and you'll work in the yard a bit. Uh, you'll get hot and sweaty because for some reason our afternoons, still the temperature goes up and uh, we live in Tucson. That's, you know, that's, that's kind of just uh, par for the course. Uh, we're in that weird season where you have to put the heater on full blast in the morning and, and put the air conditioning on in, in, the, uh, in the afternoon. But if you're outside working this afternoon and you come in, you're all sweaty, you're dirty, you're gross, what are you going to do? The very first step, lay aside those dirty, stinky, smelly clothes. Would you just jump in the shower with those dirty, stinky clothes on? No. Would you just change into some nice, clean clothes? No. We lay aside the filth that we have. We renew our mind. We cleanse ourselves. God cleanses us. And then we put on the new self. That's the third step. Put on the new self. Put on the new clothes. This is a, I know it's a simple illustration, but as I was thinking about it, this, I mean, we have to get these things in order. They have to be in the right order. If they're not in the right order, or if we skip a step, there's no point. We see the Pharisees skipped a step. The Pharisees, uh, a especially in Jesus' day as he was speaking with them, they laid aside the old and they put on the new, but they didn't renew their mind. They didn't allow God to actually change their heart, change their mind to become more like him. And so when they put on the new, it was the new that they, that they had created. It was the righteousness that they had created. And we saw from that very first verse in Isaiah that when we create our righteousness, when we try and, and uh, 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 control our righteousness and, and, and everything, all of our actions come from ourselves and not from God, our righteousness is as a filthy garment, a filthy rag. Remember, this is the image that we are portraying to others. The likeness or, or the, the putting on the new self putting on these new clothes that God has for us, this is now how we will portray, ourself, uh, portray ourselves to other, other people. And, and, and this is the new self. This is the, the clothes that we're going to wear. This is created in the likeness of God. So, this is where Paul now kind of leaves his uh, theoretical teaching, his big idea teaching, and now he's going to give us 
Uh, what, what Tom uh, referred to, what Pastor Tom referred to a couple of weeks ago is machine gun doctrine. And he's just going to go pop, 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 pop. And, and we've, we've had through the beginning portions of, of Ephesians all of these big ideas, and now he gets into some really practical things. The important thing, though, is that we have laid aside the old, that we have allowed God to renew our mind, that we've put, and, and that now we're putting on the new. Well, what is the new? So verse 25, therefore, and again, what, when you see a therefore, you ask what it's there for. I see, everyone knows that one. So here are uh, seven things that we need to do to put on our new self. Verse 25, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. In, in, uh, in short, be honest. That's simple, straightforward. Be honest. Verse 26 and, and 27. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. We see that first phrase, be angry. Really? That's okay? Uh, I, I didn't think it was all right to be angry. No, uh, being angry is fine, as long as we don't sin. We, saw, we see, uh, saw an example in Scripture of, of Jesus being angry. He's in the temple, and, and he starts turning over tables. He's mad. He is angry, and for good cause. They were defiling his father's house. He was absolutely angry, and it's okay to be angry as long as we don't sin. Now, that, that phrase, do not let the sun go down on your anger, there's a lot of uh, interpretations of that. Uh, some people stick very literally to that, and if there is some kind, and, and I'm speaking of, of couples here, of, of uh, married couples, will not go to bed angry. Has everyone uh, at least heard of that, right? You, you don't go to bed angry. Um, I don't think that's what, what Paul is referring to when he says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Um, in, in doing premarital counseling, um, a, lot of, a lot of pastors will, will say, no, you, sh you should deal with the problem uh, before you go to bed. I tell you what, if, uh, if you're awake at 2 a.m. discussing an issue, you're probably not thinking super rationally you are, uh, the emotions of the day probably are weighing you down a bit. You're probably a little more likely to snap and uh, say some things that you don't mean, say some things maybe that you do mean. Uh, but uh, you're probably going to get into more trouble by staying up at 2 a.m. and just so you can hash something out. No, I, I think what... Uh, that, that last phrase, giving the devil opportunity, if we're up at 2 a.m. discussing something, we're giving the devil an opportunity, uh, very much so. So I think what Paul is saying here is just don't, don't wait. Don't let it simmer. Don't let it fester. Uh, when, we, when we do that, at some point it's going to boil over and our anger will result in sin. But don't wait. If there's, if there's something... That, uh, that if there's an issue that needs to be dealt with, deal with it in a reasonable time. But be angry, but don't sin. Be righteous in your anger. That's the, that's our, uh, the second way that we can uh, uh, put, on this, put on the new self. Verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Now, this implies that uh, we shouldn't work to only fulfill our needs, but also to have enough to help with others uh, when they experience need. People who steal generally don't steal so much that they help other people with the fruits of their, their thievery, 
uh, unless their name is uh, uh, Robin Hood or something. Um, but generally, people who steal, steal for themselves. Well, Paul is saying, no, don't steal. Labor. Do something. And, in fact, do it so well and so often and, and to the extent that you can help others who are in need. So be diligent. Be honest. Be righteous in anger. Be diligent. Verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. This is probably the most all-encompassing verse outside of Proverbs and, and James about our speech, about our tongue, maybe even including Proverbs and James. This, is, this verse doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't specify the, uh, the kind of unwholesome word. Is it talking about gossip or slander or lying or boasting or, or cursing? No, it's talking about all of it. It's all encompassing. It says if, if what you're saying, if what you're speaking isn't wholesome, don't say it. And instead, let every word that comes from you edify. Let it build someone up. Let it encourage them. Now sometimes, if we are building someone up, if we are edifying them, the things that we need to say to them might be difficult. It might be, it might be that they have become calloused about a sin in their life. And we need to, in love, in love, confront them. Well, those words coming out of our mouth, that rebuke is still edifying as long as it is done in love. But Every word out of our mouth needs to edify, it needs to encourage, it needs to be wholesome. So our fourth, uh, our fourth B statement is be encouraging. Verse 30, and you, uh, I had mentioned earlier about grieving God. Uh, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I thought and thought and thought about what I could say in regards to this verse. And then I read, um, I read a, 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 an opinion, a, a commentary with, uh, by Charles Spurgeon, one of the most famous preachers of the 19th century. And he said it far better than I can say it. So I'm going to read his words uh, directly. Grief is a sweet combination of anger and of love. Love sweetens the anger and turns the edge of it, not against the person, but against the offense. When I commit any offense, some friend who hath but little patience suddenly snaps asunder his forbearance and is angry with me. The same offense is observed by a loving father, and he is grieved. There is anger in his bosom, but he is angry and he sins not, just as the, the, the previous verse that we talked about. He is angry and he sins not, for he is angry against my sin. And yet, there is love to neutralize and modify the anger towards me. Instead of wishing me ill as the punishment of my sin, he looks upon my sin itself as being the ill. He grieves to think that I am already injured from the fact that I have sinned. I say this is a heavenly compound, more precious than all the ointment of the merchants. There may be the bitterness of myrrh, but there is all the sweetness of frankincense in this sweet term to grief. Sometimes we forget that God has emotions. This is actually something I'm discussing with our connect group right now. God has emotions. God has anger. God has jealousy. God has um, love and compassion. He is not controlled by these emotions. He's not defined by these emotions. In fact, these emotions are defined by him because these, uh, 
these emotions find their completeness in him. But God grieves. He has this mixture of anger and of love over our sin. And Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we not grieve the Holy Spirit? By being obedient. When we are obedient to the Word of God, God has joy in His children. When we are not obedient to the Word of God, He is grieved. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. My, my first prayer for El Camino over the past couple of years has been that El Camino find its joy again. That's something that I think our, our church has, has maybe been missing. But my second prayer is that El Camino find peace. Be at peace. Don't let bitterness and wrath and anger, even righteous anger, don't let it divide you. Don't let it come in between you. God has a great purpose for us as individuals. God has a great purpose for us as a body of believers. And we've been, through, uh, throughout this, this sermon series on Ephesians, Pastor Tom has been talking about our identity in Christ, but not only just our identity in Christ, but how all of that plays together and shows unity in Christ. We have to be at peace if we are going to find unity in Him. And then the last one. Last verse, Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Now, if this was the end of the verse, it would be difficult to be kind to people that weren't kind to you, to be tended, tender-hearted, to forgive someone when they have wronged you. That's a tall order. But Paul doesn't stop there. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. It would be a tall order if Paul wrote, forgive each other. It's an impossible order to forgive, forgive each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. To forgive to that extent, to forgive to that level, and yet this isn't even the only, this is, this is one verse, yes, but there's plenty of other verses that give this exact same idea. Forgive just as Christ forgave you. How much have you been forgiven? How much have I been forgiven? To what extent has God, has God put any end On his forgiveness? Has God put an expiration date on his forgiveness? No. His forgiveness, his mercy, his grace knows no bounds. And he says, you know what? That's the kind of grace that I've shown to you. That's the kind of grace you need to show others. Be forgiving. Seven items. Be honest, be righteous in anger, be diligent, be encouraging, be obedient, be at peace, be forgiving. This is the new self. This is the wardrobe that God has created for you. These are the clothes that we need to wear, that we need to show others that we are honest. That when we say, say something, it's, it means something. That we are obedient to God. That we follow his word. That we are forgiving. When someone wrongs us, okay. 
I know how much God has forgiven me and I'm going to forgive you. The, the, these things are our outward expression to the world. And just as when uh, we saw the Pharisees go about putting on the new self without renewing their mind and everything they put on, all of their righteousness was as filthy rag, that first verse from Isaiah. Just as that is true, if we have laying aside the old, we've allowed God to renew our mind and we've then put on the new, that's righteousness. That's real righteousness. That's what he wants for us. This is how we will interact with each other as a body. This is how we will interact with the world. And they will not see us when we act this, when, when, we, when we live according to these things. They're not going to see us. They're going to see God. We live our lives in such a way, our acts are, are so good that they don't see us. They praise and worship our Father in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we, we are sinful. And too often we allow the wickedness of our heart to convince and control the weakness of our mind and give in to the wanting of our body. Lord, help us to recognize the dirty, smelly, stinky clothes that we have and be done with them. Get rid of them. That we ask you to transform our minds and therefore transform every fiber of our being and to put on the righteousness that you have given to us. A righteousness that others can, can see and others can see you through. Lord, if there is anyone here that does not have a relationship with you, Lord, tug at their hearts right now. Show them that you have something better for them. Show them your mercy and your grace, that forgiveness that, that Paul wrote about at the end of the chapter. That forgiveness, Lord, that you are just waiting to bestow on people. And Lord, in turn, allow, uh, allow us who know of your forgiveness to live a life that, that is forgiving to others, live a life that is obedient, that we can be righteous in anger, that we can be honest. These are very practical items, Lord, that you have called us to. Help us live according to your word and find the joy of making our Father pleased. We love you and we praise you. In your name, amen. Go now in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.